My dear brothers and sisters, I want to start off with some recognition. And what I mean by that is Mufti Abdul Wahab reached out to me a couple of months ago and he's like, hey, we need to hit up Alberta. How do we organize these conferences? And it's very fascinating the way things worked out. And what I want to highlight in the fact is that in Calgary, we had a sister that pretty much organized the whole thing after the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what do you think happened in Edmonton? The same thing happened as well, subhanAllah. I reached out to Sister Nuha, and I'm like, hey, we have this project. Are you on board? And she's like, Sheikh, without a, a shadow of a doubt. So can we start off by giving her a round of applause, please, for helping us put this together. Sister Nuha, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this heavy on your scale of good deeds. Here's something else that's fascinating. When I think about movers and shakers in the Edmonton community. For some reason, it's always sisters that are at the front. I think of, you know, Sister Rayan Khatib. I think of Amir Ashush. I think of Sister Nuha. And it's very, very fascinating. You look at this conference, overwhelmingly sisters. The brother seats were so empty, we had to give them to the sisters as well. Now, this is not to create a gender war. That's not the objective behind this. The objective behind this is to look at the way we view our sisters' roles in our communities. To analyze and to assess, are we doing justice towards them or not? And that analysis should also lead us to reflect, how do we treat the stories of women in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ? How often are those stories shared? How often are those stories discussed? And that's what I want to begin with, bi ta'ala. So my topic of discussion is tawakkul in times of calamity. Relying upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in times of hardship. And if you look at Surah Al-Anfal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَإِذَا تُلِعَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَعَلَى رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ That the believers are those that when they hear of the mention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their hearts move. And when the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are recited upon them, they cry. And they remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deeply. And they rely upon their Lord. So this concept of relying upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we want to tie to the previous two concepts of remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the recitation of the Quran. And the recitation of of the Quran. So now, when you think of the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm going to discuss that second. What I want to discuss is the recitation of the Quran as a means of finding solace and increasing our tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let us discuss the story of Um Musa, the story of Musa's mother, alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he describes the situation in Surah Al-Qasas. And he says that Um Musa had found out that they are going to kill her firstborn son. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed unto her, inspired her, that you know what, go and take care of Musa till you are afraid. And when that fear overtakes you, then place him in a basket and place him in the river. And do not fear nor grieve, we will return him to you. We will return him to you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspired this to her. So now when you look at the story, can you imagine the amount of strength it takes for a woman to put her newborn child into a river, knowing that eventually this river passes by the house of Fir'aun, knowing that that's what's going to happen. The amount of reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it takes to do that. Place your child. And then to leave it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's amazing how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the term fear over here. That when you become afraid that he's about to be killed, this is what you need to do. Put him in that basket. And once you've done that, don't be afraid ever again. We will return him to you. That is the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She did exactly just that. And we all know how the story of Musa alayhi salam turns out. But when we think of reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do we think about the mother of Musa? When we think about reliance, let's turn to the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. We have Ibrahim alayhi salam. He is commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to leave his family 
in a valley that is a desert. There's nothing there. There's no one there. There's no food. There's not even water there. SubhanAllah. He commands him, leave your family there. And he does that and he leaves them there and he starts walking away and he hasn't told his wife what's happening. He hasn't told his family what he's about to do. Can you imagine how scary that is? You're in a barren land with no people, no food, no water, and your husband has started walking away, subhanAllah. How emotionally difficult that must be. But she was an intelligent woman. She shouts out to him as he's walking away. And we can empathize with Ibrahim alayhi salam as well. How difficult it must be for him to leave his wife and his newborn child without being able to tell them. She shouts out, Allahu amaraka bihada. Did Allah command you with this, O Ibrahim? And he nods his head as he walks away to let them know that this is the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But look at her response over here. That if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded you with this, then know. Allah, that know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never allow us to perish. The level of reliance. The level of reliance. So now, when you look at these two stories, one from the Quran and one from the Sunnah, what is their relationship with the recitation? What is their relationship with increasing your tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? One of the functions of the Quran was to make the heart of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam firm. Through all of his calamities, through all of his hardships that he went through, how did his heart stay firm? It happened through the revelation of the Quran, gradually over this period of time. And we're not talking about the spiritual impact of it. Always the spiritual impact of it is great. But the reminders of the Quran that time and time again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us stories of pious and righteous people that go through great calamities and go through great hardships and go through great sacrifices. But what is their conclusion? Their conclusion is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took care of them. That positive ending was always for the believers. And that is the function of the Quran in increasing our reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now let's move on to the first one, which is the role of dhikr. And for me, what stuck out the most was the story of Yunus alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him to go and preach to his people. And he did, and he tried his utmost best. But it is a part of human nature that we give up on people. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he saw that he left his people, he allowed Yunus alayhi salam to be swallowed by the whale. Now I want you to think about this as well. Empathize with Yunus alayhi salam for a moment. He's in the depth of the darkness, at the bottom of the ocean, in the belly of the whale. He can shout his scre and scream his lungs out. No one's going to hear him. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspires him at that time to make dhikr. He says, La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al-zalimin. That, oh Allah, there's no one worthy of worship except for you. And I have been from those that have wronged themselves. Now what's fascinating over here is that this self-recognition that he has, that I wronged myself, and you're the only one that can help me in this situation, is so profound that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only preserved it for us in the Qur'an, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us shortly thereafter? وَكَذَلِكَ نَجَّيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْغَمْ وَكَذَلِكَ نُنْجِي الْمُؤْمِنِينَ That just like we averted him from his hardship and calamity when he remembered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and was introspective, thus we shall save the believers as well. So what we want to turn to now is the inevitable reality, my dear brothers and sisters, that we're all going to be tested and tried. Does mankind think we'll be left to say we believe and not be tested? A part of your life is that you will be tested. Sometimes we realize that, sometimes we don't. The times we realize it are tests of adversity. The times we don't realize it are tests of prosperity. But regardless of which type of test it is, that reliance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is needed to know that things are going to be okay. So how do we get to that level? When things are going sideways, things are going wrong, things are not going the way that we want. How do we find the strength to continue to rely upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Continue with the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will go a long way. 
making your normal azkar will go a long way. Saying, La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al will go a long way. Saying, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, that, oh Allah, there's no might or power besides yours, will go a long way. In fact, if you look at the tradition of the scholars, whenever they were in hardships and calamities, and they said, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uplifted those hardships and calamities from them. And this is the power of dhikr. So you want to increase your tawakkul in Allah, increase your dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then also increase your recitation of the Qur'an. Not just for the barakah of reciting, not just for the sake of reward of reciting, but reflecting on all of those stories that are mentioned therein. Those stories when, can you imagine, uh, you know, I, I think about this very deeply and I'm hoping at some point we can analyze this. But if you look at the story of the mother of Musa, putting her baby inside a cradle and sending it down the river. Is that not a traumatic experience? When you think of Hajar being left behind at the command of Allah by Ibrahim alayhi salam, is that not a traumatic experience? When you think of Yusuf alayhi salam being abandoned by his brothers in the bottom of the well, is that not a traumatic experience? Yet why is it that we see no signs of trauma in their lives thereafter? Where is this psychological fortitude that they were able to develop? And I believe, this is just my hypothesis, and this is something I'm hoping to hash out in the future. It is their tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that contributed to their psychological fortitude. So if you're able to convince yourself that this too shall pass, this too is a part of the qadr of Allah. Wallahu ghalibun ala amri. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in complete and total control of his affairs. Then this will contribute to your mental health wellness. This will be a part and parcel of you retaining your sanity in these difficult, challenging, and sometimes nonsensical times, subhanAllah. Your reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is paramount. And it is contingent upon your dhikr of Allah and your recitation of the Qur'an. But as I started, my dear brothers and sisters, just like we do a tremendous job of studying the stories of the prophets, and we do a tremendous job of studying the tafsir of the Qur'an, particularly Surah Yusuf. We also have a Surah Maryam inside of the Qur'an. Just like we have an Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een, we also have a Khadija and Aisha radiallahu anhum. Right? We need to honor these stories and remember these stories because particularly when you think of tawakkul, the two stories that stuck out the most in terms of obeying the commands of Allah are the story of Hajar and the story of the mother of Musa. Where is our honoring of this legacy? Where is our justice towards these stories? Where is our appreciation of the legacy of the women that are mentioned in our Quran and in our Sunnah? And I believe when we start honoring those stories and those legacies, that is where the conversation begins in doing justice to the way that our sisters are treated in our masajid and in our organizations. But if we're not willing to recognize that, we cannot expect positive change to take place. Again, this is not about gender wars. But this is about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creating men and women as awliya of one another. Together, we are meant to be one cohesive unit serving the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If one oppresses the other, then justice will never take place. Success will never take place. Progress will never take place. Because we're always stuck within that internal fight. But once we get rid of that internal fighting within our community by honoring this legacy and tradition that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam remind us of time and time again, then that is how true progress according to the Quran and according to the Sunnah can be made. My dear brothers and sisters, every strong community starts with strong individuals. Strong individuals are created by the reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I remind myself and you, let us increase in our dhikr of Allah. Let us increase in our study of the Quran and the stories that are mentioned therein. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and our families and our communities in these difficult times. Allahumma ameen. Jazakumullah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.